it's, I, as somebody who had to defend uh, foreign assistance budgets 10 years ago and last year, mm -hmm. it's a different story when there's a perception that people outside of the room you're in care about it. And I just uh, I thank you for the work that all of you have done and for the many people in this room who've made that change happen. I think it's a meaningful difference. Okay. Well, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for your very, very generous uh, commitment of time and effort and, and uh, great thoughts and ideas thank to you. join thank us you. here and, and our help. Thank thank you. You. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. That was great. Thanks. Sure. Keep in touch. Okay, thanks. Thanks very thanks. much. We're going to move very rapidly to our next panel. I'd like to invite Mike Merson, uh, Donna Shalala, and Joe Rospers to come up and join Helene Gale for the panel on women and girls. Thank you. Yeah, that'll be good. Uh, have the mics on? Okay. So this panel is on uh, delivering on a new commitment to mothers and girls. Uh, we're a little bit behind schedule already, and I had been asked to frame this, but I think it's been beautifully framed already um, by um, Helene, by uh, the Deputy Secretary. Clearly, the state of uh, women, women's health, children's health in the, in the world today um, is sadly uh, a picture of death disability and suffering, and it's been called a human disaster, it's been called a situation to be called dire or a health emergency, and there's a, one clear fact, and that is that the fourth and fifth millennium development goal targets, which, were reduced, which are reducing by two-thirds child mortality rate and by three-quarters the maternal mortality rate by 2015, uh, they are particularly the maternal rate, uh, we're doing really poorly, about as badly as we're doing on any other uh, Millennium Development Goal. And I'm not going to recite all the numbers, uh, but because I think you know them all, but uh, I, I don't think anyone believes we can let this situation continue. And we have three great panelists who are going to address this issue, uh, and of course it's also addressed in the report. Uh, let me start with uh, Secretary Shalala. Um, share with us your thoughts on report and how it relates to um, mother and child health. Well, I think uh, many people made the point that uh, uh, the health of women and children around the world is a proxy uh, for a number of things. Uh, the security, uh, uh, the economic development in the country, and the way they so they The report does something else that I wanted to comment on. It may be the first commission I've sat on in almost a generation that didn't represent, uh, that didn't recommend a new agency. <laughs> Even though the answer to the question of who's in charge here was no one uh, in terms of uh, uh, global health, it answers the question in a very strategic way. Uh, it, number one, it recognizes uh, the use of interagency efforts and that an integrated global health plan is not a compilation of the programs of various agencies. It, in fact, has to be carefully integrated and focused on goals, this being a major one, and that requires leadership from the White House and from the National Security Council in particular, and from the two secretaries, State and HHS, that would play major roles. So it, it, it it actually recommends some uh, organizations, interagency councils, uh, a council uh, coming out of the NSC as a way to avoid um, the kind of turf wars that you have between agencies. But it doesn't leave um, out uh, a recognition that there are numerous um, congressional committees. I probably had 10 congressional committees on international uh, health issues and that they themselves, it does no good for the administration to organize itself 
if the Congress hasn't organized itself. So if we're really going to deal with the issue of women and children, uh, my point would be that uh, we have to have some organizational form so we answer the question that someone indeed is in charge and there is in fact an integrated plan properly resourced that is truly integrated and accountable as opposed to the usual trying to get people that run different programs to try to uh, uh, talk to each other. And I think that the combination of the strategic recommendations on women and kids and organizational form, both at the Congress and the administration, are really the significant recommendations here. And I can spend this much time talking about it, not only because I have to run off and catch a plane, <laughs> because this is the only audience I think we'll ever talk to that thinks that organization is sexy when it comes to, <laughs> when it comes to inter and will understand why you have to have some kind of a, uh, a framework, a, a carefully put together a leadership team to really pull this off. So thanks, Mike. Uh, what, maybe before you go, you could just tell us, are you as optimistic as what we heard today from the Deputy Secretary? It's a lot of money and, yes. uh, and getting yes. bipartisan support, and you think we're, we're going to hold Listen, it? Listen, 20 years ago, I debated Gene Kirkpatrick mm -hmm. on whether health had any relationship to national security uh, or to international uh, security and whether it really should be on the agenda. We have come so far from those initial debates, from Helene and I begging, and you, Mike, begging for money mm -hmm. uh, from um, various congressional committees. The last thing I did before I left government was Peggy Hamburg, who's now the FDA commissioner, and I went around to the appropriations committees of, um, uh, of the military and systematically asked them for money in international health, pointing out the challenge of bioterrorism. I mean, it was like they were very nice people, but it was <laughs> like we came from a foreign land having those uh, conversations. Boy, have we come a long way, and I'm very optimistic. Mm -hmm. well, that's great yeah. to hear. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Um. <laughs> so, Joe, you and I, we, we had a chance to travel uh, together to Kenya. Uh, we were in Nairobi, but we, we also went uh, way out in um, western Kenya and saw our lot of the rural areas. Um, tell us, sort of give us your impression in, of what you saw and, and tell us a little bit of how maternal and child health, how, how, how the, what's in this report links up to what you saw in Kenya and links up to the American pub, uh, public in general. You're a communications guru and I, I think you can put it in the right perspective. Yeah, what I think was interesting about the trip was that, that we got to look at the different parts of the health system from the very top uh, to the very bottom to the community-based uh, or organizers and, and health workers. Um, and what was interesting was that uh, what we saw there reflected a lot of what we heard from the folks who were participating on smartglobalhealth.org. Um, in particular, maternal and child health was the most popular topic when we asked people to submit essays for inclusion in the report, was the most popular topic that came in and people frequently referred to it as a gateway issue to so many others, uh, whether those are other health issues or economic issues or security issues. And so uh, those, uh, those pieces of feedback that we started getting in, in terms of what folks were already submitting from their feedback around the country, we saw up close uh, talking to community health workers and, uh, and to folks at clinics in, in Kenya. Um, and folks can see on page 41 of the report uh, the, the breadth of, of places that those, that those essays came in from. And those, uh, those essays reflect the level of participation that, um, as, as Donna said, there's um, a lot of commissions in, in this town, and uh, they frequently uh, recommend new agencies, but one of the things that they don't frequently do is open up the conversation to folks outside the members of the commission. And so what we tried to do here from the very beginning uh, was to take uh, the very unique collection of people that uh, CSI has put together, uh, a couple of dozen folks from very different backgrounds, and try to build a constituency that reflected those different backgrounds, but instead of a couple of dozen people, have it being a couple of thousand people. Uh, and so over the course of the commission, we tried to uh, document uh, the Commission's work, especially the, the trip to Kenya, through a lot of content, written, photo, video, uh, as well as to encourage participation uh, in the Q&A around uh, the topics that we were uh, encountering there in Kenya, but also through all the different Commission meetings. So uh, I would encourage everyone to um, both look at uh, the report, but also uh, to engage in the further conversation uh, about the report and about uh, maternal and child health specifically that will continue on smartglobalhealth.org, because that's uh, 
uh, where how this report's going to turn into particular advocacy. There's a very, um, you know, the, there's it, it was surprising and, and, and encouraging to see just how many people with such a depth of expertise, whether it's in academia or in the field or in policy, uh, to gravitate towards the commission's work because uh, they have such a deep level of passion and a unique experience to bring to the table. Yes, uh, and you and I, we, we rode motorcycles together. I don't know <laughs> remember that. In, out there in, in Western Kenya, Maru Bay, and... Um, For transportation. With helmets. <laughs> yeah. with, with helmets. I'm not going to say. But <laughs> we wanted helmets, let me say that. But uh, tell me how the field of maternal and child health, how do, how do we... I mean, wh I'm, the American public, and you know this well, has been very favorable uh, to uh, the previous administration's initiative, uh, and how do we keep, in the context of um, our domestic situation uh, and, and all the crises we face around the world, how do we keep the public focused on the importance of this issue and, and, and keep the support politically for it? Because uh, as we know, a lot of our votes in the Congress uh, are going to be based on local views on, on topics. The answer is you have to organize. There is energy out there on maternal and child health specifically, as we saw uh, in the essays that came in, that that's uh, a very deep well of passion for, for this, this part of global health in particular. And uh, it's, it's not enough for um, folks on commissions like, like this one to just say, oh, woe is us that uh, the American public isn't engaged on this. In fact, there are a lot of people who not only are engaged on it at, a, at an intellectual and a, and a sort of policy level, but who have actual experience out in the field, whether it's uh, you know, having gone out, um, you know, in the Peace Corps or working for an organization like CARE or uh, having taken a global health certificate like they offer at, at, at Duke, um, people have a deep level of understanding and uh, there need to be, whether it's through um, organizations convening conversations like CSIS is doing or uh, other organizations that are doing legislative advocacy uh, and actual organizing around these, around these issues, people need to be connected and they need to make their voice heard because uh, there is a position to go. Okay. So, Helene, you... You, um, you articulated a few minutes ago the main, uh, in a nutshell, the main strategy for reducing uh, mortality from women and children. We, we just have lost, we've taken our eye off the ball for the past decade or two on these issues. And so how do you feel? Do you think we've got a, a good package of interventions? And, and how are we going to get them implemented? How are we going to convince people that we really can make a difference? Uh, since since uh, we haven't had the support that looks like we have now. Yeah, well, um, yes, I, I think we do have the right tools and, and the right package. And, you know, let me just say, you know, I think, w again, to this, this issue of why this is the right time to be moving this forward, I think, as, as several of the previous speakers have said, you know, I think we are in a different place than we were, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago. I think people do recognize the importance of, of global health and, and issues that, uh, unlike HIV, that you know, both you and I have worked on for many years, you know, one of the reasons why there was such a resonance uh, with HIV is that people here in this country felt it too. It was, it was truly a global issue. It was something that impacted us domestically. And so I think it was easier for people to kind of make that leap uh, of caring for people in other parts of the world where HIV was also uh, having an impact. I think today, you know, thanks to uh, communication efforts like people like Joe, and I know Pat Mitchell will talk more about why it's so important to keep the communications aspect, I think in some ways we've been able to bridge that gap uh, where people today understand these issues, even if we don't have the same rates of maternal mortality or infant mortality, I think these issues are becoming more real to our public. And I think all the work that's gone on to make you know, the sense of our global interconnectedness real to people means that we're at a different point in time where these issues really do resonate with the, with, uh, the public. So I think, one, you know, I think we are really in a good place to move this forward. Two, I think we do have uh, much more knowledge of the interventions and, and what makes a difference. You know, they're pretty st straightforward. Uh, we know that women need to have access to um, family planning so that they can face births to begin with. We know unwanted pregnancies are a huge part of what leads ultimately to um, unsafe pregnancies and, and maternal mortality. You know, I'm, I'm proud that in this report we didn't back away from that issue. We know that that whole issue, the issue of family planning, can be incredibly um, uh, 
uh, divisive. But I think what we took the approach that this is, a, this is around saving people's lives. And, and we know that a woman who has the opportunity to space births um, is healthier, as a, will be a healthier mother, and her children will also have a healthier survival. So, you know, access to the ability to, to, to um, space births. Secondly, making sure that people have access to um, skilled birth attendants and that that uh, access is appropriate depending on the level of, of, uh, of health, whether it's at the community level on up to the, the national level, and that there's in place a system for referral when there are complicated uh, pregnancies, so obstet uh, emergency obstetrical care. But, you know, another reason why we converged on this as an issue is that doing all of those things means that you also have to put a focus on a functioning health system because it doesn't just happen without having in place uh, a health system that supports the different levels of care that are necessary. So in, in some ways, by being able to measure what happens with maternal mortality, it's a way of measuring uh, how well we're doing on strengthening health systems overall. And I think, again, that's something that comes out in this report, that while it's important to continue to have these very focused efforts in particular diseases, we also want to be able to push towards strengthening the health system more broadly. And I think maternal health does that. I want to ask you to come on. Yesterday, I, uh, I, I, I believe um, Kaiser Daily Global Health Report, which comes out, many of you probably read every day, had a story that at least was of concern to me, uh, and I just quote, it says that uh, in June, as you know, uh, the G8 summit is going to be meeting, and the signature initiative of the Canadians uh, is reported to be on mother, uh, reducing maternal and child mortality four countries, but the Canadian Foreign Minister said on Tuesday, and I'm quoting here in the Globe and Mail, that this initiative, quote, does not deal in any way, shape, or form with family planning. Indeed, the purpose of this is to be able to save lives. Uh, this is coming from our northern <laughs> partner, which normally, as you said to me, is quite enlightened. So I wondered uh, how, how we're going to, the G8 is a, is a critical moment. It's only a few months away, and, and how are we going to bring family planning into this? Well, you know, I think uh, it, it is you know, uh, of note that this is something, as I said, we didn't shy away from. I think that, um, you know, the global health initiative that the administration is putting forward hasn't shied away from it. I think it is a tough issue for a lot of reasons. It has been used as a divisive issue. It doesn't have to be. It is about saving lives. It's, it really should be the opportunity for women to have safe pregnancies and to make sure that their children have uh, um, you know, the, the start of safe and healthy lives. We know that children who are born too close together are more likely to have bad health outcomes. So it is absolutely about saving lives. Okay. I think our time is up. I, I just want to say that I uh, agree with, with you and the panelists that this is really a great moment for those who have been working for decades in this field. Uh, we need to seize it and think of it as a continuum of care from the home uh, to the health facility. I also think we need to think of it as a continuum of care from the, from the mother to the newborn to the child. I think in the, historically the newborn has, gotten forgot has been forgotten. We've talked about maternal care, maternal health, and child health. And I think as you see in the report, we really emphasize uh, this continuum of care, both in terms of the, the, the mother to the newborn to the child, as well as from a delivery standpoint, uh, from the home to the community health worker to the health facility. Uh, so thank you all, and uh, I think we can move on to the next panel. Thanks.